Uh, let's do this. So uh, my name is Adam Miller. I've been in the Fedora project for a long time uh, and uh, a contributing member of in, uh, the infrastructure team, less so these days because life's busy. But um, yeah, so the infrastructure team uh, is heavily using Ansible to, to automate and provision and uh, configure all of the infrastructure in Fedora. And um, so part of my motivation as a uh, fan of Fedora, as a fan of the infrastructure team, and then also um, as a member of the Ansible team and a fan of Ansible, Kind of hoping to, to kind of drum up uh, some folks with a little bit of skill set uh, to hopefully contribute back to um, that effort. So, uh, oh, really quickly, uh, just attribution. Um, did I change? Ha. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, these are, I st stole most of these slides from James Hausnick. He's the lead of uh, Ansible Galaxy, uh, but I left the wrong attribution on there because I stole a different slide deck from James Camerata. Um, I borrowed, we shared, collective collaboration. Okay, so things we're gonna talk about today, this is like really tiny on this. Yeah, we just can't see it, that's gonna be cool. Uh, things we're gonna talk about today, we're quickly going to uh, discuss what Ansible is. We're gonna talk about uh, ad hoc command uh, orchestration, uh, inventory, uh, playbooks, and roles. Uh, so just a quick show of hands, who is familiar with what Ansible is? Very cool, okay, most of the room. So this is probably review for most of you, but just very quickly, uh, Ansible is a simple agentless, uh, simple agentless idempotent task automation tool. And the reason I make that distinction is because a lot of people call it configuration management, and technically we can accomplish configuration management because some of the things that we can automate are effectively the automation of templating, uh, configuration files, those kinds of things, just kind of traditional definition of state for the system. Um, but as an automation platform, as an automation tool, we can do considerably more than that. We can provision uh, our virtual machines, we can do bare metal uh, bootstrapping, we can actually uh, you know, work with um, networking devices, uh, those kinds of things. We can provision your cloud. Um, all, all sorts of very interesting things, and we can do so between multiple sets of hosts. Um, so we're, we have the ability to kind of work. Um... Okay, sorry, I don't like being like tethered to this thing. Uh, we have the ability to, to work between different sets of hosts and kind of jump back and forth and, and make conditional um, action take conditional action based on uh, some parameters of the environment. So um, a, a task, when, when we talk about automating things, uh, the fundamental component that we're gonna be automating is a task. So tasks, uh, functionality is provided by a module. Um, tasks are grouped together via plays, so a set of tasks is considered a play, and a play is restricted to a group of hosts. Um, a play operates, yeah, okay, so a play operates on a set of hosts. Hosts are indexed via an inventory, um, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, playbooks contain what can contain one or more plays. Traditionally, a lot of playbooks you'll see will only contain one play. They'll only have one heading with one group of hosts, but you can actually put multiple plays in a playbook. Um, and then roles, uh, with this concept of a role, a role is a bundled reusable set of content. Um, and that, that can be you know, your templates, that can be your files, that can be your task lists, those kinds of things. Um, and they're meant to be kind of all encompassing and able to be redistributed and shared and uh, reused. So this is an example of an ad hoc command. Um, so in this example, we're using the yum module. We're using the arguments to the yum module package and state, and the values we're giving to those respectively are bash and installed. So if you can see, I don't know, hopefully in the back you can see it's Ansible localhost. So localhost there is going to be our um, identifier for our host group, and we're using localhost, which is a, um, you can actually define localhost in an inventory, but we also kind of just have a, a built-in inferred uh, localhost, uh, so we know what you mean there. Um, dash M, we pass the module, which is yum. Dash A is going to be the arguments, and then from the command line you need to quote those. Uh, so that we have a, a string that's passed in to be parsed. So package equals bash, state equals installed, uh, and then you get some output. And so we have the host name, which is localhost, a status, which would be success. Uh, it's going to be success, success changed or failed. Um, here we had no change, so the status change uh, was false. Um, and then message, nothing to do. There was nothing to do for that one. Um, so what if we want to do more than one thing? Well, that's where playbooks come in. Uh, so getting started, uh, the, 
before we get into playbooks, there's a few things we're going to cover um, that kind of are in service of better understanding playbooks. Uh, so really quickly, module, we kind of covered this, but it's called by a task, uh, it performs an action, and um, you can actually use it to uh, take direct action through an API call. It's, potential, it's potentially possible that on the back end, the module wraps a, a command line tool or something, but the idea is that the module handles what is necessary to uh, perform item potent task uh, declarative state. So you have the desire that your system has the package bash state installed. You, you request that of the module and then the module goes out and handles that for you. That's kind of the idea uh, behind it. And, and in, in, this, in, you know, in this instance of yum and DNF, it calls the respective backend Python APIs, but uh, in, the res in the instance of certain modules, it just there's not a you know, reasonable Python API. Something to note uh, about modules. So right now, uh, Ansible includes, I think, somewhere in the ballpark of 2,200 different modules. Um, so if you need to do something, there's a reasonable chance that we have the functionality now. Um, however, you can write your own, and something to note about writing your own is you can write your own modules in any programming language you want, so long as it, in, it sec accepts JSON as input and will return JSON as output. Um, however, to have your modules be accepted upstream into Ansible core, uh, they need to be written in Python. So, facts. Uh, facts are provided by the setup module. Um, anybody who's ever done anything with configuration management uh, in the past is probably very familiar with this. Uh, it basically just kind of goes through and scans the system and, and provides you a set of facts about the system. This can be uh, platform, architecture, distribution, uh, name, uh, release, major, minor version. Um, it can be your network uh, interfaces, what their IP addresses are, you know, IPv4, IPv6, those kind of things. Um, and it provides those in a standard, uh, standard way with standard names so that you can actually use those as variables inside of your playbooks to do conditionals, those kind of things. Um, oh, and variable substitution. Um, so anyways, uh, it's using the, the set fact. So there's, a, there's kind of like a, a high order uh, built in called set fact. And uh, you can actually, on a play, define if you want to, um, or I'm sorry. Uh, gather facts. So there's a high order uh, thing in plays. You can say gather facts true or false to whether or not you want to have your play go out and do that scan or just skip it all together. Um, but you can actually create a fact uh, in line in your playbook using set facts. So if for any reason you've gathered some uh, output, you've registered the output of a task and you therefore want to keep that persistent for the host uh, for the duration of the play uh, playbook for the host you're working on, you can do a set fact and it will actually store that um, in uh, whatever means you have. You can cache facts, but we'll get to that later. So inventory. Inventory defines your infrastructure. Um, you can define it using a static file. You can just write everything out. You can do it dynamically. We have dynamic inventories, and those will query some system. Uh, so in the instance of a infrastructure as a service provider, such as AWS, Google Compute, Azure, uh, OpenStack, those kind of things, we have dynamic inventories that will go out and query what you've created uh, within some confines or parameters, return the metadata. You can then um, index your hosts that way on the fly, uh, which is very powerful in, in the sense of if you are using Ansible to create systems out there, but then they're immediately available in your inventory uh, and you can, you can work with them from there. So Ansible provides a considerable number of uh, uh, dynamic inventories. We have them in Contrib. There's also the new the new way. There's inventory plugins. Uh, we're, we're still working on getting those built up. I think we've got about 10, 10 or 12 of those right now, but uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of them available in in the in the contrib directory of of Ansible. So uh, this is an inventory. Um, so inventories traditionally were any files. We also now support YAML files. But if you're going to do static static file definition, uh, you just this is it. So you have a group name, which would be web, and then you have a list of hosts. Um, there are certain uh, variables that you can list out here, and there's different ways we can do that, uh, but that's a little bit outside the scope here. This is this is an inventory at face value. So we'll note here web being our uh, group name, and uh, these being our hosts. So anytime if I were to run that ad hoc command from before, where I said localhost and I do Ansible web dash m yum dash a package equals bash state equals installed, it will actually run, go out and run that on both of these systems now 
because the group is web and that's my identifier. That's my filter. Um, so playbooks are text files. They're written in YAML. Uh, they define a set of plays and they bring to vet together inventory and tasks. So <clears throat> when, and, and we'll, actually we'll just go for it. So uh, this is a playbook. And the idea here is that the playbook is relatively easy for somebody who's never seen one before to understand what's going on. So let's read it from top to bottom. Uh, so a name. So the name of this play is to install and start Nginx. The hosts we want it to run on are our web hosts. From our inventory, that's where it's going to run. Uh, so become means that we want uh, this to actually become a privileged user. Then we have variables. So these variables are going to be passed into the rest of the play. Um, so we have Nginx packages. These are going to be packages that we want installed. Nginx test message and Nginx keep alive timeout. Now, in the tasks, this is our task section. So just like we did with the command line, this is how we will, this is how we will stream together many tasks, is in the task section, we would do what we would have done from the command line, just instead we define it with a name, which would be install Nginx packages, and then we can say yum, and this should look pretty familiar, name equals, state equals, um, and then the thing, the, the, so name equals item, state equals present. So the thing where we throw a curveball here, and what's new, is this is how you um, do variable substitution. So we use uh, Jinja2 templating language. So if anybody's familiar with Jinja2, it's a relatively popular uh, Python uh, templating language. And so you, you know, open curly, open curly, close curly, cro close curly. The thing to note about item uh, in this instance is it's a built-in loop. Um, so down here with items, with items we'll loop through the list. So nginx packages up there we've defined as nginx python pip python devel and gcc. Um, it's going to iterate through each one of those. Now something to note is uh, while this is still supported today and will continue to be supported, uh, we've recently introduced a new feature. Uh, but it's possible that not everybody's using the develop branch of Ansible. Uh, but in the, the new version, we're, we're actually just going to have a, an inherent loop uh, to where if you pass in um, the, uh, the list in a loop, we'll, we'll do some things for you. It'll be kind of like syntactic happiness. Um, the other thing to note is the yum module, oh gosh, is that 2.4, two, two, 2.5? Two, I don't remember. Um, at some point, the yum module will actually accept a list. So you can kind of just skip this these days. Uh, and, and if you do that with the YUM module or the DNF module, uh, you actually get a, a performance increase because it will accept it and parse it uh, as a single transaction. Um, but <clears throat> for, for the example of a task, the concept of doing with items to be able to loop, you can do that with any, any module. Um, specific modules are going to have different capabilities based on what they're doing, based on what the developer of the module has implemented, um, but with items is a construct of the playbook that we offer for anything you're doing. Um, so the next one is uh, name, install, uh, uwisgi. Uh, so we're going to have pip. Oh, did it not? Oh, I didn't highlight pip for you all. Okay, uh, so down here, pip. We're going to use the pip module to go and install uh, uwisgi. Uh, again, state equals present, uh, and not, I mean, not all of the modules are just install and define state. Some of them can get very, uh, very sophisticated, but um, just for, for case of example, it's, you know, keeping it easy. So, uh, includes the imports. <clears throat> uh, let's say that we wanted to define a set of tasks and we wanted to reuse it over and over again and we didn't want to have to rewrite it or copy and paste it around to all of our playbooks. What we can do, you can use includes and imports. So you can import a file containing a list of tasks. They're kind of commonly known as just a task list or a task file. Uh, you can pass it parameters. You can do it, can, you can include conditionally, uh, and the idea is to encourage code reuse. Uh, so includes and imports, just a quick note is uh, with includes, I'm sorry, with imp imports, uh, it's what we consider static. So they are parsed, um, they're pre-processed, whereas uh, include statements are uh, dynamically uh, evaluated when they're run into. 
Uh, and that has two implications. One, for certain things like loops where you need to actually reevaluate it every time, uh, that can be very powerful. But two, uh, it does actually have a memory um, implication on your control host. So the, the place where you run Ansible from is considered your control host. So when you execute an Ansible command or an Ansible playbook command, on a host, we consider that the control host, and then all the machines that you're you're controlling from there uh, to be your nodes. And the control host uh, is where you're going to you know do most of your processing. It's where the templating happens. It's where play plugins uh, fire off. Those kind of things. And uh, so when you do includes, there's a lot of memory being copied around constantly because everything's being reevaluated a lot. So just note that your performance profile or your, your memory profile is going to be a little bit different uh, performance wise if you're using a whole bunch of includes versus imports. Uh, and that's why generally if you don't need anything dynamic, import is, is the way to go. Um, and that, I mean that's not like a hard requirement, it's just kind of like a best practice for huge air quotes on best practice. We hate that term. Uh, okay, so includes and imports. So let's say I had a task list called add host name, uh, and then <clears throat> I would then f include all the tasks defined in add host name. And then here I would include tasks from add host name with a parameter with the item, so I would loop through and I would re-include that each time with a new parameter. So let's say for some reason there was, um, maybe maybe the with item should have been like a list of host names or something. So that way each time uh, it gets loaded, the param variable within the context of the at host name could be variable substituted for whatever uh, item in the list. Um, and then, uh, so, uh, the import tasks, again, so if we're not doing any substitution, import tasks is kind of the better way to go. Uh, but here we can actually conditionalize what we're importing because we can template the file. So this can be very useful because you can name your conditional imports uh, things that are Ansible facts. So for example, you know, distro family. So if you've got um, Red Hat based family or Fedora specific as opposed to CentOS um, or Debian or SUSE, those kinds of things, like you can actually import specific tasks that are catered to those specific distributions, conditionally doing this. Uh, and then there's also a, um, we have conditionals uh, for, for specific tasks themselves. Uh, okay, so a role. So we can kind of take everything that we've just done for, you know, tasks, plays, playbooks, and we can bundle it up together into a role. And then the role can actually be reused and distributed and shipped around and those kind of things, shared amongst teams. Um, oh, that's out, of, that's out of order. Okay, we'll just go with it. Uh, so the plugin, so plugins augment Ansible core functionality. So uh, action, cache, callback, uh, connection filter. I had a talk on uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, what's today? Today's Friday. Wednesday. Uh, the talk on Wednesday was actually about plugins. Um, I was hoping that schedule-wise that those would be switched so I could say, hey, if you want to learn more about plugins, go to this, but here we are. Um, so what's interesting about these is you can enable different plugins to augment uh, the functionality. One of the most popular ones are going to be for your timing profile. So you can actually see which tasks are taking the longest. You can see how long your entire playbook uh, runs. Um, those kind of things. So if you know you have a quote unquote hotspot in your in your playbook, you can kind of have a a, a very uh, well defined or a well documented you know index of that. Um, another thing is uh, callback plugins. Those are very uh, popular for the sake of being able to do take action based on. Um, the beginning, end of a certain task, success, failure, those kind of things. So in the event that something uh, fails, you can send a message somewhere to your IRC channel, your bot or something. Or if something fails, you can have your bot like ping people and say, hey, this failed, maybe somebody will look at it, those kind of things. Um, so yeah, so examples. Uh, oh, the other thing is connection plugins. So <clears throat> when you run uh, on the inherent local host, uh, using the Ansible command line, you actually get the Ansible local connection. Uh, so we'll actually run Ansible local instead of trying to do a round trip, you know, you're not doing Diffie-Hellman handshakes to your local machine because you don't need to. 
Uh, whereas we can also do SSH, Docker, Chiroot. There's there's a number of connection plugins. Some of them are going to be specific for network devices. So, like, don't try to use you know like the Arista or Junos or you know, Cisco IOS connection plugin for your Linux box. You're going to have a bad time. Um, but we have all these different connection plugins that can kind of be used uh, for optimizing um, talking to different devices or different systems in ways that might not, um, that might be needed or necessary or might be more appropriate than just a straight up SSH connection. But the default when you're doing remote hosts is going to be SSH unless you specify otherwise. Um, so an action plugin, um, action plugins take action on your control host before going out and contacting the remote host to run the module. Uh, so some of that's going to be, you know, copy, fetch, synchronize, and so like for synchronize, it needs to literally synchronize something from localhost to the remote host, and it has to sometimes do some prep work. I don't know, tarball up something, synchronize it, untar it, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a full list, and uh, we have extensive documentation on those. If anybody's interested in those, okay. So uh, back to roles. <clears throat> what is a role? Uh, so we briefly discussed this. So uh, roles are made up of plays. Uh, why is this? Oh, okay, this is, yep, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I somehow got my slides out of order. All right, so uh, <clears throat> in contrast of what a role is, being all, all encompassing and defined, playbooks are made up of plays, and playbooks are opinionated. So the reason that this is um, important is because a playbook is defined to a set of hosts, it will define whether or not you need to um, you know, become privileged or not. Uh, you're going to gather facts or not, depending on what you need uh, for, for that specific set of things. You can set your connection plugins. You're going to have specific variables, those kinds of things. And generally, those definitions are going to be specific to the set of hosts that you want to run the tasks in that play against. Um, so they assume specific inventory and they target uh, a specific use case. And they're generally not very reusable, uh, and b but by, by design. Like, it's not a fault of them. Normally, you're trying to accomplish a specific task, and that's what your playbook is for. Uh, but in the sense of wanting to, uh, so again, so this is a, the, our example playbook. You're doing installing Nginx, uh, and then you install WSGI. You're going to copy your default conf. Um, we're going to put a template over there, to our template file. So .j2, that's Jinja2. We also use Jinja2 for templating our files. So you can have a Jinja2 template file. Do anything your heart's content for the Jinja2 templating language, which we have pretty extensive documentation on. Um, Jinja2 is very Pythonic. So if anybody codes in Python, and you want to do for loops and logic and all that kind of stuff inside of your templates to um, you know, define different sections of configuration files based on multiple entries and lists, that kind of thing. Uh, we have all of that functionality. Um, so, and then, you know, we'll copy our index HTML with the swapped out uh, change of our default message. Um, oh, handlers. Um, so, we also have this thing called handlers. Handlers are effectively specialized tasks that only get fired in the event that something notifies them. Uh, and, and that allows you to conditionally, um, like, restart services or reload services only when something changes. So if you have a template file that lays down a configuration and you notify your handler and that template file didn't change, then it won't fire the handler. Whereas if you just define a task to reload your configuration file, it's going to reload the config or restart your daemon every time you run the playbook. The handler is meant to conditionally execute something on your behalf in the event, only in the event of a change. And that's kind of the idea, is to handle an event as opposed to always execute a task. Um, OK. So the roles, roles are meant to be decoupled from the inventory and the plays. Um, but they're not just a set of tasks. So you can do the set of tasks that you import or you include. And you can reuse content that way. And that's very powerful. Um, however, roles kind of take it to the next, next level it's because they're self-contained, they're reusable, and they're a complete unit of work. Complete unit of work being kind of an operative term there. Um, they should depend on nothing, and they should perform everything that they claim they do in, in its entirety. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you're, if you're attempting to install Nginx and configure it, 
And the role is meant to do that. It should not assume anything about system state. It should ensure that all the packages it needs are installed. Um, it should have templated uh, files embedded in it and simply take variables passed in from uh, your playbook to populate those things. Um, so we'll kind of go through. So if we switch to a role, <clears throat> let's say we have role install nginx, and we pass it variables packages, nginx text message, and nginx keep alive timeout, that should carry out all of the operations that we previously, de previously defined. Um, it should de verify that our packages are installed, it should set up our test message with our default configuration file, those kinds of things. Um, but we need to actually convert that playbook into a role so it can be reused. And what's powerful about this, and, and the goal here, is let's say that you have multiple data centers, or if you have different systems, or you have different systems that are attempting to do different things based on uh, whatever your specific use case is, and they all need this. They all need a web server to then serve some purpose. Well, you could just copy that playbook around, or you could import it a whole bunch of places. Um, but when you get into really, uh, when you get into kind of higher order sets of logic in your playbooks, and you're doing things conditionally, and, and those kind of things, and you have templates, well then you have to copy around these templates and that kind of stuff, whereas with roles, it's all, all in one. And we have various ways to install roles, discover roles, that kind of stuff, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So um, there's a so really quickly, Ansible Galaxy is uh, our index, our public index for it's kind of our forge. It's our public index of uh, all contributed content in roles. If you need to install something, nginx, PostgreSQL, those kind of things, look there. There's probably a role to do what you're trying to do um, that you can just go out and use at face value or potentially contribute to. They uh, they should all be open source. But uh, we have an Ansible Galaxy command. And the Ansible Galaxy command allows you to install roles from that, from a personal uh, hosted Galaxy or uh, any arbitrary um, remote file, because you can just tar up a, a role file, or from a Git repository. I think we also support um, SVN or Mercurial. I don't remember which one. Uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, so this is what Galaxy looks like. Um, it recently got a redesign, if anybody's familiar with um, Patternfly. We redid the UI of Patternfly. It's very nice. I'm a fan. Uh, so you can go out to Galaxy, galaxy.ansible.com, and kind of check out what we have out there, those kind of things. But the Galaxy, uh, the Ansible Galaxy command has an init subcommand. And the init subcommand allows you to initialize a module on your home directory. And that's going to set up the directory structure that you need. Uh, it's going to have you know various metadata files pre-populated that you can just go in. They're all commented and documented. And you can go in and just fill in some fields, those kinds of things. So um, yeah, so you can download from Galaxy. I already covered all this. Um, so <clears throat> This is actually how you would install. So if you found one on Galaxy that you wanted to, uh, the author in Galaxy, the author is the namespace. So your GitHub username uh, is going to be your namespace if you upload uh, role content to Galaxy. Or you can just install one from wherever you want. Um, you can actually have a requirements.yaml if you want to define multiple roles that are required for your task at hand. So if you're, if you're setting up in, in one, uh, playbook, you want to set up your database server, you want to set up your web front end, you want to set up your load balancer, you want to you know, rotate things in and out, that kind of stuff. Um, you can define multiple roles that you need to have installed and required and then just do a single install before starting your playbook. Oh, okay, so roles are traditionally going to be the default role uh, path is, uh, is I'm pretty sure Etsy, Ansible, I should know this. I was running on my local directory because I run everything off of source on Git checkout. I should know this, but I don't. Um, you can, in your Ansible config, you can set default role path. Um, you can set the environment variable at the command line, Ansible roles path to whatever you want. Uh, you can use <coughs> a colon to provide separate paths because of course you can. 
um, and a roles directory next to the playbook. So if you have a playbook in your current working directory and there is a roles directory in that same current working directory, any content, any role content that is in that roles directory will be detected at runtime. So what's in a role? Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff. So uh, previously, you know, theoretically, let's just pretend that we ran that, that uh, Ansible Galaxy init uh, install nginx command. So this is what we would have been left with. So we have uh, Travis.yaml, uh, because if you are running your Travis stuff, uh, you, we can report that through Galaxy. Uh, a readme, so it comes with a readme, kind of the idea there is to have you know, some sort of documentation for users who are potentially going to reuse your role, whether that's locally on your uh, team or externally to the world for anyone who's gonna upload something to Galaxy. Um, defaults, so these are gonna be your default variables. Uh, files, so any kind of file that you're gonna copy around and just lay down at face value that doesn't need to be templated should go in files. Um, handlers, again, this is going to be a task list that defines your handlers that are conditionally executed based on something notifying them. Uh, your metadata, metadata, that the meta directory is purely for Galaxy uses. If you're not uploading the Galaxy, you probably don't need to bother uh, filling that out, but please, please contribute to Galaxy. Um, tasks, so this is going to be where all your task files are. You can have one or many. Um, you can kind of, the only requirement is that you have one called main, and that's going to be the entry point into your role, it's main uh, meta, so tasks main.yaml. Templates, uh, again, so files.j2 for Jinja2, templating files that are put in there uh, that get templated at runtime and, you know, copied around and those kind of things. Tests, uh, so if you have tests, probably going to be related to your Travis.yaml. For those who don't know, Travel, Travis CI is a CI system hooked up to GitHub. Uh, you can put tests in. A lot of people actually, interestingly enough, your tests are written in Ansible playbooks. There's a lot of assertion things that we can do with, with playbooks. Um, all of the Ansible integration tests are written in Ansible. It's very meta. <clears throat> so, uh, and then vars. So you can define your set of vars that can be passed in, those kinds of things. Okay, so task.main, this is going to be your entry point. It's going to be what drives your role. So when somebody just in either includes, or if anyone imports your role or includes your role or defines it in the role section of their playbook, this is what, what the entry point is. So this is going to be your, you know, int main uh, if you're a C coder. Um, so this is going to tie together all of your templates and handlers and tasks and, and, and those kind of things and, and hopefully be kind of the driving logic. Now, the main thing to note is you can actually have multiple other task files that can be conditionally included or imported. So you can actually combine some of this functionality together where it makes sense. Um, so your tasks, so what we had before in our playbook, the task section, you can literally just drop that into the tasks file in main.yaml. And the idea there is, again, this is a very, this is a relatively simple example, so it might seem a little like long-winded to kind of put this in a role, but the idea is if you have something, so let's say, for example, this playbook took into consideration various different distributions you have in your environment. It also took into consideration different package names for those different distributions, and you have, you know, various parameters and conditionals, and it kind of just cascades and the next thing you know, you have this relatively complicated uh, or complex set of um, tasks that are, are you know, ordered and, and defined, and then you need to use it a whole bunch of different places. Well, um, instead of copying that around, and you have this ability to, to re just reuse it through the role, and that's kind of the, the driving idea behind this. So, uh, handlers, handlers.main. Um, the module that runs will indicate when a change has occurred. When the change has occurred, the handler, handler will trigger. Um, you can also do topic handlers. This is new Ansible 2.2. Uh, I won't really go into that a whole lot, but the idea is that you have a, a, a topic definition and you can, you can notify or, I forget the other vocabulary term was for that. Um, basically, the idea is just if something changes, uh, so for example, so our template, this is how we would do this. Um, notify being kind of a top order instruction, so name, uh, template being the module name, and then notify, uh, and then we'll say start nginx, that will uh, start or restart nginx if that file, uh, if the template 
module reports changed. So the idea there is the template module being item potent in nature will only report changed if the templated file it's putting out on the remote host actually changes. Handlers by name. There we go, listen. Uh, so listen being the other vocabulary term. And there are different implications on this, uh, listen versus uh, notify. Uh, I don't remember, I'd have to check the docs. I genuinely don't recall. I should, sorry. Okay, <clears throat> files and templates. Uh, files is the base directory, uh, and templates is the base directory for template files. The main thing to note there is when you're in a role and you have templates and files in their respective directories that are namespaces they're supposed to be, you don't have to refer to their full path or the relative path. You can just say the file name and the role knows where to go look for it because it's, it's a standard directory layout, um, those kinds of things. So uh, that can be very useful just because you don't have to type as much. <clears throat> okay, so for example, so our template file here, you'll see these, these file names are just source nginx.conf.j2, index.html.j2, uh, but we don't have a directory listing there and that's because they are in the template directory, uh, therefore the role knows where to go find them. <clears throat> And this is where we put them. Okay, so this is our nginx config template file. So we can uh, in there define or do uh, variable substitution. You can also do other fancy things uh, with the Gentoo 2 templating language. But this is probably going to be your most common thing to do is just in place variable substitution for config files, those kinds of things. But if you have a lot of sections of a config file that you need to basically replicate, so virtual hosts. If you're, if you're doing virtual host entries and you want to put in a whole bunch of virtual hosts, you could have a list of you know dictionary variable entries or something that defines all of your virtual hosts and then you can loop through them and, and lay down those configuration files there. There are the configuration sections to the file. Um, so, you know, here's our index.html uh, with a templated uh, message and a paragraph. Uh, our variables, so defining uh, variables the user can override in the defaults uh, for, for conditionals and configuration settings, and then variables main, which are going to be used by the author. So that's kind of you as the role author, hopefully, you as the role author, um, can, can use to organize a role, additional files, uh, and uh, to dynamically kind of like change things up within the role. Um, so anything you want your, your potential users, the people who are gonna consume your role to reuse them, put those in defaults. Uh, so defaults.main, so we have our packages, we have our nginx test message, nginx keep alive timeout, um, and then those are kind of, you know, uh, used for the variable uh, substitution in, in the templates as well as in the playbook. Uh, meta main, so this is going to be uh, specifically for Galaxy or for or if you're if you're pulling content from Galaxy as a dependency for yours. That's the other thing too is you can actually do recursive dependencies for roles. So if for some reason uh, your nginx role needs, it's probably a bad example. Let's go the other way. Let's say you're trying to install some web app and and you have a role for that web app. You can say that my web app role requires this nginx role so that way it will set things up and I know that this is a mild contradiction because I said before it should be a complete unit of work and that's true it should be a complete unit of work for the task that it, it sets out to accomplish however if there's a different unit of work that you need to rely on that needs to be in place before your unit of work occurs you can set dependencies uh, so that way at runtime uh, it will install the role that you need and then it will actually execute that role first uh, so so those those are ways that we allow to kind of cascade, uh, daisy chain those together. Uh, dependencies, you can define dependencies, role, uh, some parameter. Uh, you can define them source if, uh, if they're not gonna be from uh, Galaxy. If they are gonna be from Galaxy, you can define them as uh, name being namespace. Gearling guy is, is a very, uh, uh, well-known contributor in Ansible land. He has a lot of amazing content on, on Galaxy. He wrote a book, uh, pretty sure. His is Ansible for DevOps? I think that one's his. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, anyways, great, I mean, great community member. He's done amazing work. His book is fantastic. Check it out. Uh, but anyways, so uh, gillingguy.php, uh, FPM. So we would then pull his role from Galaxy. Uh, documentation, we kind of talked about that before. MetaMain is going to be for uh, Galaxy specific stuff, README, uh, and you can also embed an example playbook. Uh, tests, again, uh, Ansible playbook tests and your Travis.yaml configuration. Um, modules and plugins, you can actually add a library directory with your custom modules if your role needs custom modules that we don't have and you want to distribute them on a separate lifecycle than Ansible core, you can do that. Or you can have a type underscore plugin for custom plugins. Um, one thing to note, if your users uh, of your role have a bug in your module and they come to us and they're like, hey, this thing broke, it's a module, please fix it, Ansible Core will not fix your module. I mean, somebody might. Somebody might just be like, oh, that's really cool, I'll check it out, but no. That's, that's kind of like you get your, uh, you get to play with your broken Legos if you, uh, if you break them. So uh, in a play, to use a role, you have a role section. You can do it that way. Um, you can also include roles as, to make them seem a little bit more like tasks. And this is very powerful for uh, na -na -na. Um, passing different variables to different things at different places, uh, but also, yeah. So we can say include role, and we can say tasks from. Um, so, if for some reason you want to include a tasks file from a role, but not execute the entire role, you can grab just a uh, one of the tasks file out of the tasks directory of that role by defining tasks from. So, for example, the name of this role will be my role, and then in the tasks directory, there's going to be other.yaml, and you would say, I want the tasks from other out of that role, just that specific set of, of tasks. And, and that can get, you know, that can allow us uh, a little bit more flexibility in some of the things that we're going to do. Uh, okay. Do I not have? Yeah, okay, perfect. This is what I was hoping. I was really worried I didn't have this example. Okay, so you can do an include role with items. So you can include the role multiple times by passing different sets of variables, which is very powerful for uh, hopefully obvious reasons. Um, and then the next one that I really like, and this is what I think has a lot of, um, <clears throat> I think this has a lot of uh, applicability for various different workflows is because the role section of a playbook, or a play, a role section of a play always gets included and always gets executed. Uh, so you can set some variables, you can set some, you know, when conditions in there, but to be honest, the syntax is just kind of weird. And that's why I'm a big fan of uh, include role or, or import role with a when condition, uh, just as far as cleanliness of playbook, the ability to, you know, st adhere to the simplicity of a playbook being something that somebody can understand who isn't well-versed in Ansible. Um, you can include a role by name uh, only when a condition happens. So. Uh, check out Ansible Galaxy. There's a lot of role content up there for anything that you need to do. Uh, please uh, hopefully use... Um, oh, something to note just from a Fedora infrastructure standpoint, if you do find something from Ansible Galaxy that you want to use, it needs to be imported into the, Ansible, into the Fedora in, uh, infrastructure's uh, Git repository. Um, Fedora infrastructure does not actually pull roles at runtime on the fly. It has to be uh, kind of like sneaker netted over into the Git repo just as a point of uh, <clears throat> note for, for anyone wanting to contribute. So hopefully this was useful. Um, please automate the world and, uh, and please you know, bring some of that magic back into Fedora infrastructure. Yes, Dennis. So the, the, que the question is, how do you handle package installs? Because there's DNF and there's yum. Uh, how do you handle package installs for, for different distros? So there, there is a package module. Um, it has limited functionality uh, because like the DNF and the yum modules can, can do all sorts of things, like you know, do exclude repos, enable repos, that kind of stuff. But if you just need to raw install or remove that kind of stuff, the package module will automatically detect which 
package manager is in use on the back end and, and pass that off. Uh, something to note in Ansible 2.7, um, uh, I, I, I actually, it's like on me, uh, it's on the roadmap to have the yum and DNF modules have be f at feature parity and for them to be interchangeable. Um, so you will be able to actually run the yum module against the Fedora machine and get DNF on the back end um, because, I mean, technically the yum command is still around even though it's kind of a lie, but it's there. Um, yeah, so we do have a package module, absolutely. Uh, the big kicker um, that we always tell people to watch out for is your package names are going to change. But, you know, probably from CentOS to Fedora or, you know, Fedora to RHEL, it's pretty much the same. Right. Right, exactly. So the comment was Apache in Debian is Apache 2, whereas it's HTTPD in Fedora. And yeah, so that's where, that's generally where like can the, the variable substitution will come in. People will have variables to define the sets of packages they need based on which distro they're working with, and then just pass the appropriate uh, variable at runtime once we've detected the platform uh, based on the Ansible facts. Question? I'm not sure I understand the question. So you're trying to just grab a single file from a Git repo? So are, are, you, are, you, are you attempting to get clone or specifically like web URI request? Yeah, yeah, you can get clone with the git module, absolutely. Yeah. Question? So in the past, uh, when I was using Ansible, I had to like go around the row command to install package DNF in order to get, it didn't work either for both uh, for Fedora. So what I did for Jake was like in the same thing. So the question was, in the past, you had to install Python DNF uh, because it didn't work out of the box. So um, that is true if you use the default Python 2 interpreter, which is assumed. If you actually pass in your inventory host uh, file that a host should use the Ansible Python interpreter for Python 3, it will work out of the box because it will then use the Python 3 libraries. Um, do note that, uh, again, because we're just going to be talking about all the Python 2 features today, or I'm sorry, Ansible Python uh, 2.7, I can't talk, the Ansible 2.7, 2.7 is going to be a weird one for us. The Ansible version 2.7 feature, uh, we're actually going to auto detect the interpreter on the remote end and Python 3 will take precedent. So you shouldn't have that problem in the future, uh, but right now for, uh, for Ansible to support Python 3, you have to d define a host variable that tells it to use Python 3. Uh, as opposed to Python 2, and then it'll find, yeah, it'll find it that way. Um, there are a handful of other uh, things that we kind of, in in Fedora, I think since Fedora 25, have to bootstrap, so you have to tell it to install um, the, like, the SE Linux Python stuff and various different things, uh, just because uh, the things that the module use aren't default in the distro anymore, but uh, yeah, so there's um, there's documentation for, to handle different scenarios, but specifically for DNF, yeah, we just need to tell it to use Python 3 and it'll pick it up. Another question? Shoot. Oh, the, the, it, 
Okay, so the question is, can you run like the Ansible command for an ad hoc task, but perform a role? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, that needs to be a playbook. Could be interesting. Shoot, let's keep it going. Yes. So the question is, uh, in, in, tra in Travis CI, oftentimes people will claim in Galaxy that they support multiple distros, but don't actually support multiple distros because they're not testing on multiple distros. Uh, there is, I believe it's called Kitchen, Kitchen CI. Kitchen CI does multiple distro and things with Chef and Ansible and those kind of things. Um, so from our perspective, as far as, uh, like, I don't think it's an official project recommendation, but me personally, if you're going to do that kind of testing things locally, uh, there's a project called Molecule. Um, that does, it has various providers on the back end, Vagrant, AWS, GCE, those kind of things, um, and it'll do multi-distro, and it'll do, um, you know, effective verification of your playbook. So, uh, let's see. Can I, let's try doing this. Um, So if you just go to molecule.read the docs, that'll, that'll take you there. Um, I can't remember who created this initially. There was a startup that got bought, I think they got bought by Cisco, but they originally made this and uh, it's been amazing. And we're, we've been talking with them a little bit to do some project integration and that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's what I would recommend. I don't, you know, I won't claim that's a, an Ansible official recommendation, but me personally, I think that's what I would, you know, that's what I've done in the past, and that's what I'll do. Do you have another one? Okay, well, let's, real quick, let's go uh, to Dave, uh, and then, uh, actually, it's lunchtime, so if you just, just want to come up, we can chat, I'm happy to chat. Latest. Yeah, so uh, Kevin Fenzi, Nirik, uh, Fedora Infrastructure Lead, he maintains Ansible in uh, Fedora, and I think he probably lags behind upstream by maybe a week. Uh, he generally has it packaged the same day in Koji. It just takes a little bit to get through Bodhi. Um, yeah, so latest. We're, we're always pushing latest stable in, uh, in Fedora Infra. All right, yeah, we'll, we'll chat. <laughs> All right, thank you all.